Okay, good evening to everyone, um, or afternoon, wherever you may be. Um, so I'm very excited about this um, this new series on Eliyahu. Um, oh, good evening. Hi. Um, so like I said, I'm very excited about this new series about Eliyahu. Eliyahu is really, you know, one of the most interesting and dramatic, puzzling figures in, in Tanakh, and not just in Tanakh, because Eliyahu, besides the, you know, the chapters that he takes up in Tanakh, he also sort of reappears so many times. And uh, even later in Tanakh, he's mentioned. And in Chazal, Chazal, the, the Talmud is filled with the stories about Eliyahu, about uh, Chachamim meeting Eliyahu, speaking with him, revealing himself. Um, we have a prophecy about Eliyahu returning uh, in Yemot Mashiach. Again, regarding, you know, all of those, all of that material, you know, the question is, is it, is it to be taken literally or not? But nevertheless, it, you know, even if it's not to be taken literally, there is a reason uh, why why Eliyahu is, the, is specifically the one mentioned. So, so um, clearly, uh, you know, one of the most fascinating figures in all of Tanakh, and there's a lot to learn from it. And um, that's what we'll try to do. Now, the, the Shurim, and nothing I'm saying here is a, my own original. It's all based on an excellent book. Uh, probably comes backwards on, on, the, on, the, on the camera. But it's called Pirkei Eliyahu by Rav Elchanan Samet. Rav Elchanan Samet is one of my uh, Rabbeim for Tanakh. I studied um, from him in uh, the Yeshivah Man Adumim. I say I have two uh, Rabbeim for Tanakh, two primary ones. One is Rav Elchanan Samet and the other is my father-in-law, Rav Carmel. Uh, which uh, for those who were in the Shurim on Yeshayahu, I primarily followed his book on Yeshayahu. And Rav Samet also tremendous, all his books are tremendous. I highly recommend all of them. He's written Pirkei Eliyahu. Then he has another volume following up on this one, Pirkei Elisha. He has on Tihilim, and he also has, I think maybe already six volumes on, on the Torah, on Parashat Shavua. And uh, everything that he writes about uh, is, is, is incredible. His analysis is, is uh, Tremendous. His, his main innovation in the study of Tanakh, which we will also see as we go along, you know, besides the, you know, very uh, careful analysis of the Psukim and what their message is, he has a, uh, he has a, he has tremendous insight when it comes to analyzing what I, what is called in Hebrew, mivne, structure. In other words, he focuses mainly on stories on Tanakh and he tries to figure out what their structure is and not just a technical structure, which isn't very useful, but sort of a, a deep analysis of the structure. And he comes that, from that to, uh, to some very uh, incredible insight in, into Tanakh based on his analysis of structure. If those, if anybody here, I think there may have been in my shiur on before Purim on Parashat Zachor, there we also followed uh, Rav Samet's analysis of the story of the, uh, the war against Amalek. And his whole analysis there was based on a careful analysis of the structure of the story there. Um, so he does that also to some extent in, in his book here on Eliyahu, besides other things as well. Now, the stories of Eliyahu begin, begin in Melachim Aleph Terek Yudzain, in Kings 1, chapter 17, that's where they start. What's unique about the stories of Eliyahu, especially in the book of Melachim, and, and for that matter, all of Tanakh, um, at least maybe, I guess, putting aside the, the actual books of the Nivrim themselves, but within these books of Melachim, et cetera, what's unique about it is that in the stories of Eliyahu and following later on by his student Elisha, the main figure of the story is the Navi, the prophet. Okay, why do I say that's unique? Because if you look at all the previous stories, who is in the center stage? The center stage is like the book is called Melachim, the king is the center stage. You have Nevi'im appearing, but the role of the Navi, he's not the central figure. The Navi comes to advise the king, to rebuke him, but he's not the center figure of the story. The center figure of the story is primarily the king, the people involved, you know, the family of the king, everything that, that goes into that. And the Navi is, is sort of a, you know, and that really should be his role. The king is the one that needs to lead everybody. The Navi has a specific role to advise, to do certain things. Um, you can say the exceptions to that are uh, Moshe Rabbeinu, or Shmuel, but true, granted, Moshe is certainly a prophet, and also Shmuel was also a prophet, 
but they weren't just prophets. They were also the leaders of their time. They were sort of like, not exactly the king, but they were the, they were the primary leaders. So they weren't just prophets. Moshe, yes, he was a prophet, but he was the leader of Am Yisrael in his generation. Shmuel, also, he was the prophet, but he was also like the leader uh, until he appointed uh, Shaul to be king. So certainly he was the central figure. We understand that. But Eliyahu and Elisha, they are in um, later times and where, where the king, where we already have kings and in all other stories around, you know, from when, when, we, when David the Medes comes on to, you know, the, the center stage um, until the end of uh, the book of Medachim, uh, you know, with the, um, with the exile, the kings are on the center stage, not the Navi. And the only exception is these stories of Eliyahu and Elisha, where all of a sudden the Navi takes certain stage. That's, that's one thing very unique about the stories of Eliyahu. Another thing that's very unique about them is this idea of a continuation between two prophets. That I, we have a prophet and then a student of his who is the next prophet following in his footsteps. Again, we have continuations like Moshe to Yoshua. That's more of a continuation in terms of the leadership. And king, certainly, we have father, son, after father, etc. Um, with prophets, we don't find that so much. So um, here it's interesting that with Eliyahu and Elisha, we do have it, this, this idea of a one prophet continuing you know, his master. Um, and another interesting feature of Eliyahu and Elisha, which is pretty much unique to them, is the sheer amount of miracles that they do. Eliyahu does a tremendous amount of miracles, and also um, his uh, student Elisha does a tremendous amount of miracles. We find other prophets doing miracles, but not, not to the extent of the so many miracles that, that they did. So that's also something uh, we'll need to look at about the role of all these miracles in, in, in what they do. Because it, it, you know, it's just the, 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 the sheer quantity of the miracles that makes them uh, unique as opposed to other Nevi'im. Okay, so that's, that's just a little bit of general information. Okay, now let's start getting started. And to understand, Eliyahu sort of, as we'll see, he sort of jumps on the scene, appears on center stage. But we need to study a little bit of background uh, to Eliyahu. So first of all, just to map up where we're located, we're talking about the, the period of Melachim, where there is a separation between the, the Yehuda and Yisrael. We have the kingdom of Yehuda and the kingdom of Yisrael. They were separated after Shlomo Amelech, during his son's time, Rechavam, Yeravam, he split the northern kingdom of Israel away from Yehuda. Really, really, it's not so. If, if we look historically at all the, you know, from going back already to when Am Yisrael started, they were always divided. There was always this separation between Yehuda, which was mainly the tribe of Yehuda, and maybe a little bit of addendums to that, and the larger kingdom of Israel, which was led primarily by Ephraim, along with the other uh, tribes. They were always divided. They were united for a short time under David and Shlomo, but primarily, you know, they were divided. Even if we read Sefer Shoftim, you can read about the division between Yehuda and Israel. It's always under, under the, it's always there, that separation between them. So David and Melech, he was unique for a while, even though he himself, you know, for a while, he was just for the tribe of Yehuda. And only later on, he was ex able to extend his kingdom over everybody. And his son, Shlomo, continued it. Due to the sins of Shlomo, Hashem decided that it would be split up. But it wasn't such a split that was created at that time. It was just sort of going back, you know, to, to the division that they were accustomed to beforehand. And this, this persisted until the, uh, the, the kingdom of Israel was completely wiped out uh, by Ashur, by the Assyrians. And then they came off the face of history. And we're only left with uh, Yehuda, and that's why we're known to this day as Yehudim. But in the times of the Melachim, they were split up. Um, and, in the, and we have the, the book of Melachim sort of goes back and forth. It goes back and forth between what's going on in the kingdom of Yehuda and what's going on in the kingdom of Israel. And sometimes there's interplay between them. Sometimes they have good relations. Sometimes they're at war. So it varies the relations between Yehuda and Israel, you know, uh, uh, vary throughout uh, that whole historical time period. Where is Eliyahu active? Eliyahu is active in Israel. Okay, 
He's active in the Northern Kingdom, um, and he's primarily active during one particular king, which is Achav. Okay, so if so, that's 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 where so that's where so he's going to be active as opposed to other Nevi'im that were active more in Yehuda. Eliyahu is active in Israel. That's where you know that's where he's 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 operating in in, in that kingdom. Okay, now what is the background? What is the situation when he comes onto the scene? So basically, it depends how you look at it. From a physical, political perspective, the situation is actually pretty good. From a spiritual perspective, it's quite bad. Okay, and we'll read a little bit about just what happened before the Yaw appears, starting with Omri, the king of Israel, who was the father of Ahav, and Ahav himself. Okay, so we'll read that. That's in the chapter, in chapter 16 in Kings 1. Um, and, and we'll read a little bit about what, what went on there. I'll just say briefly that up to Omri, the situation in the kingdom of Israel was terrible. Okay, it was literally terrible. No king was surviving. Each king was being assassinated by somebody. In other words, uh, Yerovam, he was the one that started the kingdom, but his dynasty did not last, as the prophets declared. And after then, it was a terrible mess, the kingdom of Israel. They were not doing well. They had no stability, and it's just one assassination after the other, each king living a very uh, short time. Until Omri comes on the scene, and when Omri comes on the scene, uh, uh, on the scene, politically, the situation starts to improve, and with Achav even more so. As we'll see spiritually, there's a tremendous deterioration. Okay, so let's see, let's see what, what happened there. So I'll open it up here in um, Sefaria. And this is far your website because we have here both the English and the Hebrew. So it says here, starting from Melachim uh, Tetzain 16, chapter, verse Kafdim uh, 23. It says, So again, in Melachim, they always give the dates, uh, you know, to, so you can align them. Again, and there are a lot of problems with the, the numbers here. Uh, as, um, um, but we're, we're focusing just what happened here in Israel. So said in the third, Malach Omri al Israel 12 shana, betirza Malach Shashani. In the 31st year of King Asav Yehuda, Omri became king over Israel for 12 years. He reigned in Tirza six years. So he started off ruling and he made his capital city. His capital city was in Tirza. But then what happened after that? So very interesting, it says, Vayiken et ahar Shomron, et Shemer bechikraim kasef. Then he bought the hill of Samaria from Shemir for two talents of silver. He built a town on the hill and named the town which he built Samaria, Shomron in Hebrew, after Shemir, the owner of the hill. So very interesting. This looks nice. Omri is building himself a capital city, and this city is going to be for quite a long time the capital city of the kingdom of Israel, the, the city of Shomron, okay? So it seems like he's doing well, okay? This is a bit reminiscent of David Amelech uh, buying Yerushalayim and setting up his uh, his palace there, and then later on, of course, the Shlomo, the Beit HaMikdash, okay? So Omri seems to be doing well, and he's building up a city for himself in, in Shomron. That's on the physical level. What about the spiritual level? Not so good. Omri did what was displeasing to the Lord. He was the worst than all who preceded him. He followed all the ways of Yerobam ben the son of Neva and the sins which he committed and caused Israel to commit, vexing the Lord, the God of Israel, with their futilities. Again, the main sin of Yerovam ben Nevat was Yerovam ben Nevat, and it doesn't say Omri as well, apparently, they were not idol worshippers. Rather, their big sin of uh, Yerovam was that he set up an alternative to the Beit HaMikdash in the kingdom of Israel. He put the, uh, the two Agalim uh, that he located in two different places, and he sought to prevent the people of Israel from coming to Yerushalayim. The reason he did that was he was concerned that if they would come for spiritual reasons to Yerushalayim, they would ultimately want to come back under the, king, the kingdom of Yehuda. And that's what he was concerned about. 
Now that, of course, was a sin because once Yerushalayim was chosen as the place for the Beit HaMikdash, you're not allowed to worship Hashem and offer sacrifices elsewhere. But in those times, it was very difficult for uh, people, and it was throughout a good part of the history, to accept uh, this idea of having only one place that you could worship Hashem, only one place for sacrifices. As we see many times in Tanakh, they didn't remove the other altars that existed all over the place. And Yolavam especially, the, you know, he, what he started off, that's persistent. Okay, but it wasn't yet idol worshiping. It had, didn't reach that level. It was bad, but not the level of actually going after other gods. Okay. The Yeter, Divrei Omri Asher Asa, Ugvurato Asher Asa, Alohim Ktuvim Al Sefer Divrei Amim Lemalchei Yisrael. The other events of Omri's reign and his actions and the exploits he performed are recorded in the annals of the kings of Israel. So we see here also an illusion that at least politically Omri was doing well. It says, Ugvurato Asher Asa, you know, his heroic actions, his exploits. So Omri, spiritually again, he was worse than the previous ones. But in terms of leadership, uh, in terms of success, successfulness, politically, you know, whatever it was that he did, it seems to be that the situation was good. Okay, and then it says, "Vayishkav Omri mavotav, vayikaver b'shomron, vayimloch achav b'no tachtav." Omri slept with his fathers and was buried in Samaria, and his son Achav Sakid succeeded him as king. This is no mere achievement for a king in the kingdom of Israel that he would able to die of natural causes. Most of them, or many of them, were assassinated. So the fact that we have a king here passing away, being buried in his capital city, and his son ruling after him, that's a success. In other words, Omri has managed to establish a dynasty. You know, he has a, he has a capital city, and he has a son, um, you know, taking over the, the reign after him. So from that perspective, he's successful. Let's see now what happens uh, in his, with his son's time. With his son, we have a little bit of information here, and then we can pick up also a lot more things from, from the stories later on, his encounters with Eliyahu, but even here we have quite a bit of information. Okay, so it says now, V'achav ben Omri, Malach al Yisrael b'shnat shloshim u'shmone l'asa melech Yehuda, Okay, so you can see here there's a bit of a problem with the years because it says that Omri took over in 31 of Asa and then he ruled for 12 years. So that should lead us to year 43. But nevertheless, it says here that Achav took over on 38 of Asa. Okay, so we have these problems a lot in Sefer Malachim. We won't get into it now, but... I'm just pointing that out, uh, but this is quite common that we have these types of questions in Merachim, when you're trying to work out the figures, you, you run into all sorts of problems, but the, there is, there is a, a deeper meaning behind it. Okay, but we won't get into it now because we want to get to it now. So it says, So he reigned for 22 years, impressive. Achav, son of Omri, did what was displeasing to the Lord more than all the who preceded him. Not content to follow the sins of Yerovam, son of Nevat, he took as wife Izevel, daughter of King Etbaal of the Phoenicians, and he went and served Baal and worshipped him. And let me ask you a question. Putting aside the fact that he worshipped the Baal, is the fact that he married the daughter of the king of the Tzidonim, is that a good sign or a bad sign, politically? What do you say? Bad sign. Bad sign. Why? You're on you, you. Because of the Phoenicians and not um, not from Israel. No, no, I'm not speaking about from a spiritual perspective, from a political perspective. 
Is that a good sign or not? What? I'm sorry? I didn't answer, but you obviously oh, you think answer. it's a good sign politically. Politically, it's a good sign. Why is it a good sign? Because of associations between the people. Right. It's a it's political marriage. Okay. Political marriage means that there's some sort of um, agreement, political alignment between the kingdom of Israel and uh, the Tzidonim. The Tzidonim are up north in what you know is currently uh, Lebanon, right? So Tzidon, those cities, that's where they were located, the Phoenicians. So, so that's already good. There's a, a you know political treaty between them. Furthermore, Achav is marrying the daughter of the king. Usually, I think we, usually the, the way it worked was that when you had a political agreement between two uh, royal families and they would do it by marriage, the more powerful king would take the daughter of the less powerful king. So if Achav is taking the daughter of uh, the Tzidonim, that's a good sign for him. In other words, it indicates that he's a stronger king. For example, the Egyptians have this tradition, which we know not to be completely correct, but it was correct for most of history, that they said the daughter of Pharaoh was never given to another king. What did they wish to indicate by that? They wished to indicate that they always had the upper hand. The Egyptians, they were always the more powerful ones, which is striking when you think about that we do have one, one individual who did marry, take the daughter of Pharaoh, Anybody who knows who that was? Who was the one king in our history that married the daughter of Pharaoh? At least one, maybe there was more, uh, but one clearly. That was Shlomo Amelis, King Solomon. King Shlomo, he married the daughter of Pharaoh, in other words, indicating that he was a stronger king. Now, he also married amongst the women that Shlomo Amelis married. Again, he married, you know, as Tanakh says, a thousand women. And again, it was all political marriages. Um, he also married the daughter of the king of the Tzidonim, of the Phoenicians. In other words, what Achav is doing here is not completely new. It was, it was already, there's a precedent to it with Shlomo having done it. Again, Shlomo did much more than that. But, but Achav is following sort of in the footsteps, at least in regard to the, the Tzidonim, the Phoenicians. And again, actually Shlomo, David the Melech didn't take a daughter of the Tzidonim, but he did have connections um, with that area of the world, he had um, he was uh, aligned with uh, uh, Hiram, the king of Tso, uh, Tso and Sidon, again, right by each other, two cities uh, in what we call uh, current day Lebanon. And in other words, so politically, you know, the fact that he's taking a daughter of the, of the Tzidonim, that's good. Okay. And in some way, it's, a, it's sort of rekindling, you know, what used to be in the times of, 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 of a Middle Shlomo. The problem was spiritually it was a tremendous deterioration why because he took this woman Izevir, and he ends up worshiping the Baal okay in other words this is this is already like here it says he was not content to fall on the sins of Yerobam Devat again the sins of Yerobam Devat wasn't idolatry it was worshiping Hashem but not in the correct manner they should have gone to Yerushalayim and they set up alternatives Achav is taking it, going another step further, and he, now he begins worshiping idolatry, and he follows the, the idol, the Baal, this idolatrous practice of the Tzidonim. Okay, so this is much worse. Okay. He even goes so far as he erected an altar to Baal in the temple of Baal, which he built in Shomron. Okay, so in his capital city, he puts together an altar for the Baal. Okay, again, more idolatry. And that's why it says here, Achav also made a sacred post. Again, the Asherah are these trees that they would plant uh, by where they would erect an altar for idolatry. According to Halakha, you're not allowed to make an Asherah, even if you're doing it for uh, worshiping of Hashem. Hashem Right, you cannot put an asherah, a tree next to even uh, Mizbech of Hashem. But he did it, um, he, he, he also did this idolatry practice. And that's why he says he was angering Hashem more than any of the other kings of Israel before him. Okay. And we'll see later on in the stories 
of Achav, that Izevil was quite active in promoting this worshiping of the Baal. She brought in prophets of the Baal, and she also tried to kill off the prophets of Hashem. So Izevil and Achav went along with this, was quite active in promoting this like, idolatry in Israel. And in this regard, it was much worse than what happened in the times of Shlomo. The times of Shlomo, as we all know, Tan the Tanakh says that his wives worshipped idols. But it doesn't seem like that was promoted. In other words, they did it probably, you know, continuing their own traditions. And Shlomo incorrectly allowed it to continue. But here we have a king actively worshipping idols and promoting it amongst uh, the kingdom of Israel. That's why it's so, it's so bad. Okay, finally, the last information we have on him is in Pasuk Ramadad, it's also very interesting. During his reign, Kiel the Beth Light fortified Yericho. He laid its foundations at the cost of Ibiram, his firstborn, and set its gates in the cost of Seguv, his youngest, in accordance with the words that the Lord had spoken through Joshua San Binu. Okay, so what's going on here? So the background to this is we, if you read in the Sefer Yoshua, the book of Yoshua, after the destruction of Yericho, Yoshua made a curse that nobody should rebuild the city. And anybody who would rebuild the city, both his firstborn and his youngest would die, okay? And because of that curse, everybody was afraid to try to rebuild Yericho. Until here, the times of Achav, we have somebody coming along, rebuilding Yericho, and indeed the curse of Yoshua comes through and he loses his two children, right? His, um, as it says here, he loses his, uh, his, both his eldest and his youngest, his firstborn and his youngest son, they both pass away. In other words, the curse of Yoshua is fulfilled. But on the other hand, he does rebuild the city, okay? So we have here a very strange situation. Spiritually horrific things are being done, right? We have for the first time the introduction of a Vodat Abar, the worshiping of, a, of a, an, a, another god in the kingdom of Israel. Nobody had done that beforehand, at least not that we know about. And we have here another example of somebody, you know, willing to, to go against the decree of Yoshua Binu not to build, not to rebuild the city of Yericho, the city of Yericho being a symbol of, you know, the conquering of, 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 of Eretz Knan by Yoshua. And on the other hand, even though with all this going on, politically, they seem to be a success. There's a new dynasty established, there's a capital city, and there's, there's political alignments with other nations. So things uh, physically, politically seem to be going well. So to counter this, to counter this, it's not going to be an easy task, okay? When everything is going bad, everybody realizes the situation is bad, okay? And the prophet that comes along, you know, and he says, oh, it's because of your sins, et cetera, et cetera. You know, okay, they'll say, obviously, things are not going well. Here, we have a situation where things are going good, but spiritually, they're terrible. For a prophet to be able to point this out and get people to listen to him, he's not going to have an easy task because they're going to say, no, what are you talking about? Everything's wonderful. If we're behaving so badly, then how come we're so successful? Okay, things are going well, right? They're not, it, it, he's going to have a very difficult time. So to be able to counter a, a successful king like Ahab, who seems to be doing well and believes he's doing well, he thinks he's doing well for his people, you're going to need a very powerful prophet to be able to stand up against him, okay? So within this structure, we can understand why it's not going to be your regular run-of-the-mill prophet who's going to come along and speak and that's it. It's going to need to be somebody who's much more powerful. And as we, we'll see, Eliyahu is ready for this challenge, perhaps too much so ready for this challenge. And he, he goes to extreme, very extreme measures to, uh, to counter Ahaz, okay? So that's the, that's the historical background.
Okay. Now let's see what happens when Eliyahu comes on the scene. Just before that, I want to see something very quick regarding the role of the miracles. Okay. Now, as we will see, Eliyahu does quite a bit of the miracles, including the first thing that he does when appearing on the scene, um, where we'll see he decides to suspend all rain. Okay. In other words, he seems to be in control of the forces of nature. So there are several questions on that. First of all, what is the general function of miracles when a prophet does it? And secondly, who's making the decisions? In other words, this is sort of a general question that we need to ask about a prophet. Is everything a prophet doing and that he is doing, is he all getting specific instructions from Hashem how to do it? Because we'll see Eliyahu does quite a bit of things. And it's not so clear Who's decided that he should do those things? Is it his own decisions? Or was he told by Hashem to do it? Some prophets, it's clear, right? Hashem says to him, go and do this. And then he goes and says, does that. Hashem says to him, go and say this. And he goes and says that, okay? Sometimes it doesn't tell us specifically that Hashem told him to do so. But the prophet will say, Hashem has told me to do such and such. So again, from that, we can learn on, yes, this prophet has received an instruction to do so and so. With Eliyahu, and then later on in Elisha, we'll see it's not so clear. They're doing a lot of things, a lot of incredible miracles, but it's not so clear whether they were actually instructed by Hashem to do all those things. Okay? So let's just see something very interesting from a very interesting point, the Rambam. The Rambam, he has his, in his commentary to the Mishnah, he has an introduction to the, his commentary in the Mishnah where he discusses a lot of uh, very fundamental things uh, about Torah and in general about our faith. So it's, it's very worthwhile to read the uh, Rambam's introduction to the Mishnah. And one of the things that he discusses there is the role of prophecy. And he tries to explain what exactly the, the function of prophecy and of a prophet. And he mentions there also a Leo. So let's see what he says. Uh, I also have it on Safaria with an English translation. As there is follows. Okay, he says, "Vani roish ze ha makom ra'uy leva'er bo aikar ze, bi yefshar el achrei she nechalek ta'anat itiyachas al nevuim benevua bemat itzdak al nevua she zek mochen ikar gadol." He says, "And I see that this is a fit place to elucidate this fundamental principle, and it is impossible to do so except after dividing the prophets that claim to have prophecy according to the way their prophecy is validated." which is likewise a great fundamental principle. In other words, what he's going to establish is how do, we, how do we know that a prophet is a prophet? What tells us that a prophet is a prophet, okay? And he says there is a big, big people have a, have a mistaken notion about this. And he says, Uchval shagubo kol hamon adam gam metei mispar miyudehen so he says, and already all the masses of people, and also a small number of their notables, have erred in this, as they imagine to themselves that prophecy does not exist with one who has it, until he does a wondrous sign, like the signs of Moshe, our teacher, may his memory be blessed, and he changes the manner of the world, or like the Yahweh, his memory for good, did in bringing back to life the son of the widowed woman, or as is known to every person with the signs of Elisha, peace be on it. In other words, he says the mistaken notion people have that a prophet, in order to prove that he's a prophet, needs to do a miracle. How do we, well, what's the, why, why do they think so? Because we see that Moshe Rabbeinu, when he first came to Pharaoh and to Israel, to Am Yisrael, he did miracles. We see Eliyahu started off with doing miracles. Elisha started off with doing miracles. So they think, why are they doing all these miracles? To prove that they're prophets. So Rambam says, no, that's a mistake. That's not why they were doing the miracles. A prophet doesn't need to do a miracle to prove that he's a prophet. So what's the role of these miracles? Okay, and here's the, the, uh, the critical part. He says, In other words, this is not true. 
‫לא עשה אום כדי לקיים נבואתם, ‫שהנבואה כבר נתקיימה להם קודם לכן. ‫אבל עשו האותות ההם לצורכיהם, ‫ולרוב קרובתם אל הקדוש ברוך הוא ‫השלים חפצם, ‫כמו שהבטיח לצדיקים ‫את גזר עומר ויקום לה. ‫אבל תתקיים הנבואה ‫במה שנספר בדבר שהחלנו לדבר. ‫אז הוא אומר, ‫זה לא היה פונדמנטל, ‫טרו פונדמנטל פריטבול. As everything that Eliyahu and Elisha and the rest of the prophets did of these wonders, they did not, they did not do them in order to establish their status of prophecy. As their prophecy was already established before them. Rather, they did these signs for their needs. And because of their abundant closeness to the Holy One, blessed be He, He fulfilled their wills. As it is promised to the righteous ones, and you will decide to say it, and it will arise for you. But their prophecy is established by that which we will explain about the matter that we have begun to speak about. In other words, and then he goes on later to explain how prophecy is established. But he says it's not through miracles. And he says the reason they did these miracles wasn't to prove that they're prophets, that their prophecy was already established based on other criteria, which he explains, goes on to explain. What was the function of their the miracles? Why were they bothering with these miracles? So that's what he says here, and here's the critical line. He says, they did these signs for their needs, okay? They did it, they had needs that for which they did, they had a purpose for which they did these miracles. And because of their abundant and closeness to the Holy One, blessing be he, he fulfilled their wills. So Rambam is saying, these miracles that we see of Yahweh and Elisha doing, wasn't that Hashem told them to go and do these miracles. They did these miracles because they thought they, this needs to be done. Why did Hashem fulfill, why did Hashem, obviously Hashem fulfilled these, these miracles because these miracles happened, they worked. It was because of their closeness to Hashem, so Hashem fulfilled their wills, okay? And this is going to be a key factor, which we'll see about Eliyahu, and it's going to be, I think, we'll be able to be, prove it also from the psukim, the verses, that some of these miracles, or maybe many of them, Eliyahu wasn't told by Hashem to go do it. Eliyahu decided it, and Hashem carried out what Eliyahu decided, okay? Now, when we think about it at first glance, it seems to be very surprising. How could that be, right? The prophet, the Navi, his, his mission is to bring Dvar Hashem to the world. You know, he, he is sort of the, the link, the connection between Hashem and the people. He's just supposed to be the messenger the emissary carrying out the will of Hashem. So, so what, what is he going out in seemingly, as we'll see, it'll be very surprising. Why is he all of a sudden calling the shots and he's making the decisions and Hashem is carrying out Hashem, like Rambam says, the, the Navi is dec decreeing and Hashem is fulfilling. Seems to be very strange. How could that be the role of the Navi? Um, but Rav Samet in his introduction here, he gives a sort of an interesting idea which as we'll see, is something which is very fitting for all the stories of a, a Navi like Eliyahu. And he says, he brings the following parable, okay? Imagine you have somebody, you know, somebody owns, let's say an estate, okay? And he appoints somebody to work on his behalf, okay? So the question is, what kind of powers does he give to that person? So it all depends on that, how much he trusts that person and what are the talents and characteristics, experience of that person. If you have, let's say, somebody very new with very little experience and you don't trust him, you're not going to give him a lot of leeway to make the decisions, right? You're going to tell him precisely what he should do and he needs to do that. However, if let's say you have somebody that you, you believe he has every, all the knowledge and experience that is needed to run the estate and you fully trust him, then you may say to him, you know what, I just want your estate to run well, how, or by a business, whatever it is, I just want the business, I want the company to be successful. All the details, you can manage, you know what my goals are. Everything else I leave up to you to do, if somebody that you have full trust. So he says, a Navi like Eliyahu, he fits into that role, okay? Unlike other Naviim that perhaps Hashem will go and tell him, you know, precisely, this is what you need to do, or precisely, this is what you need to say. And even then, the Navi has sort of his own way of wording it, et cetera. We never have a Navi 
which is completely doing precisely exactly as Hashem said, there's always room for uh, the Navi's own personal sort of contribution. But with the Navi like Eliyahu, it's more than that. He's sort of given the keys to the estate. And he says, look, we've got this problem. He understands that this is his mission. We have this king. He's a successful king, but he's bringing idolatry. We have to deal with this somehow. Okay. And Hashem is sort of saying to him, okay, you know, you, you see the problem. Or Eliyahu understands this is the problem. And he knows where, where he needs to get to. He needs to get the people stop worshiping idolatry, returning to the worship of Hashem. And he's given the keys to, to run the show. So he's making decisions. Okay. And as we'll see, his very first decision is to stop the rain. Okay. Which we'll learn once we get into the verses. And Hashem is carrying out his, his desire. And because of his closeness to Hashem, Hashem is carrying that out. Okay, and that's what it seems to be the remedy. And as we'll see, and then every everything that happens afterwards also, not everything, but a lot of the things that the Yahweh does, he declares it and Hashem carries it out. Okay, having said all of that, as we will see something very interesting as well, and this is something that goes throughout the stories of Eliyahu, even though Hashem is carrying out the decisions of Eliyahu, these miracles, he's not always so happy completely fully on board with them. And there is an element also of Hashem educating Eliyahu as well. That's one of the very interesting things of the stories of Eliyahu, uh, which we will see uh, uh, next time or in the next few times, how on the one hand, Hashem is giving Eliyahu the independence, but on the other hand, he's also attempting to educate Eliyahu within this whole process. Okay, any questions or comments? Okay, all right, very good. So good night to everybody, and uh, thank you for joining in. Thank you, that was very interesting. <laughs>